Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the second set or second installment in our series on helping get your dog ready to go back to visits. Um, my name is Lori Schlossnagel. I am one of your ATD board members. Um, I am also a dog trainer. Um, and I'm putting on even a different hat today. Um, I'm also a certified canine behavior consultant. So I deal a lot with body language and how dogs are talking to us um, by what they're doing with their bodies. So we're gonna talk about that today. Um, I want to start with just a little bit of um, information about what we're doing. So first of all, if you have a question, please pop it into the chat box. If you have not found that yet on most computers, it's down at the bottom of your Zoom um, and you'll see a little talk bubble. And right now it has a red number by it, which indicates how many messages are in there. Um, and then Kelsey's going to moderate those questions for us. If she can't, she can't answer it, um, she'll throw it out to me and I'll answer those questions for you. Um, also, you can get a hold of me um, either through ATD, my email through ATD. You can also um, message the Facebook page. I happen to have some access to that. Um, and so you can always ask questions there. Um, the last thing I want to say is body language is a little tricky. Um, a picture, a photo, a still photo is just a moment in time. Um, if you have a particular question about something, I may ask you for video um, because sometimes that picture is not going to give me enough information. Um, and so I am happy, I am very happy to answer your questions, but just know that I may need a little bit more information. Um, I'll give you a great example. I'm pretty sure that at least two of my dogs think that I'm stealing their soul when I try to take their picture, even when they're very happy um, and very relaxed. As soon as that camera comes out, um, we get a lot of really stressed body language. So um, I, that's why I don't really love photos, although I do have have some great ones to share with you today. Um, I always prefer video. So let's um, jump in and look at some canine body language. I know that you all know your dogs really well. Um, and I'm hoping that what you'll see today will help you know them even better um, and help you as you transition back into visits and doing things with your dog, just help you be a better team and be a better advocate for your dog. So I'm going to screen share. I do have a PowerPoint I'm going to share with you. Um, and this, like we said, this is being recorded. So don't panic about taking notes or anything. Okay. There we go. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about canine body language. Um, I also want to um, remind you to take into account the breed of dog that you have. Um, a lot of these things are very general statements, um, but your particular breed may differ slightly from what a general statement might be. So don't um, think of anything negative necessarily. It may just be about their breed. Um, for instance, some sight hounds um, typically look like their tail is tucked in underneath their bodies. It's just the way that they are. They're not tail tucking. They're not necessarily afraid. It's the structure of their bodies. So we always want to keep that in mind. Okay, so let's talk some canine body language. Maybe. There we go. There we go. Okay, it's not always this obvious. Um, so um, it would be great if it were, we'd have a really clear picture of what our dog was feeling. If they were really clear when they were upset, fearful, sad, anything like that, versus when they were super, super happy. There's a lot of dogs out there who were really very, very subtle with telling us how they're feeling. Um, so that's a lot of what we're gonna talk about today. So I'm going to start with those subtle signs of stress in our therapy dogs. Um, and I went through, the, the list is long, of course. Um, and I went through and I picked out things that I remembered seeing either in my own dogs or in dogs that I have observed or have been on visits with or whatever the case is. So I'm just 
I know you can all read, but I wanna talk a little bit about each of them. So I'm gonna run through real fast. Panting, especially when the temperature is not too warm. Um, I totally understand. I know our assisted living centers are really warm. Um, and I take that into account for my dogs if they're panting in there. But if I'm doing a window visit in the winter, even as beautiful as it is today, this might be a sign my dog is a little stressed. Shivering. I'm actually going to show you um, a little video of one of my dogs who will appear to be very cold in situations that are very, she's very unsure in until she is very confident in them. Um, for I'll, I, I'm the first to admit it for a long time. I really just thought she was cold. She's a very short haired dog, as you'll see. Um, and I have since discovered that that's not the case. It's, it's a stress response. She's very unsure of her environment. And so she does some shivering at that point. Scratching or licking themselves, um, especially those dogs that don't wear collars all the time, which we talked about last week, um, making sure you're getting that on them a little bit more. But if you feel like it's a little bit excessive that they have to stop and scratch or stop and lick, it may be um, a sign of stress that things are not going quite the way they think they should. A spatulate tongue meaning exactly that. Instead of that tongue hanging off to the side, um, happy-go-lucky panting, it's more of a straight out and it's more of a rigid tongue. Looks like a spatula. That's where the word comes from. Yawning is another one that happens a ton. The nice thing about yawning though is that some dogs will yawn to diffuse a situation. So um, I'll give you an example. Um, Perhaps your dog and you visit a support group of some kind and the support group gets a little tense and things are a little bit more uptight in that support group. Your dog may start yawning to diffuse that environment um, to try to get everybody basically to start yawning and to relax a little bit. Other dogs will yawn because they're stressed, but this yawning can go either way for dogs. Um, Belly up, another really misinterpreted um, dog body language. I wanna talk about that a little bit more. I do have a photo. So we're gonna go back to that one. Shaking off, that shaking off, I've gotta get a really good shake going. Um, I actually encourage this in my own dogs. Um, and a lot of times my dogs will walk into a facility, shake off and then be ready to visit. Um, if you have a lot of that happening, happening repeatedly, Again, probably stress that they're trying to diffuse. Blowing of coat, um, basically meaning if you got your dog already, they've been bathed, they've been brushed and combed, and you go to run your hand on your dog's coat and, and you end up with a handful of dog hair, probably a stress response. Um, it, it happens a lot, we see it a lot. Um, especially um, in dogs that are laying down, we'll see more of it. You see that hair kind of falling to the ground beside them. So uh, just another stress response. Um, dilated pupils, um, know what your dog's eyes normally look like. Um, some dogs you can really read. Um, my dog that was squeaking the toy a minute ago, um, when he is super stressed, he is not a therapy dog, um, but, um, when he gets super stressed, his pupils get really big. Um, and so then when he's starting to calm down, I see his pupils get much smaller. So he's very easy to read in that way. Um, whale eye, where you see a lot more whites of the eye than you normally do. Um, a tongue flick or lip licking, again, very subtle. You might just think they're, um, they got a drink or they just had a treat or something like that. But if you're starting to see it regularly, probably a stress response. Um, smiling is another, some dogs smile all the time. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this. I've got some pictures, um, but smiling can go either way. So I want to, I'm going to shelf that one till that slide comes up again. Sniffing the ground. One of the age old things. Um, I have hounds. I talk a lot about sniffing the ground with them. Um, but it's also a way to say I'm super stressed and I don't really know what else to do with myself right now. So I'm gonna sniff the ground. I'm gonna get some information. Um, I'm going to feel better. Um, part of why they feel better is the olfactory part of a dog's brain is so big and takes up so much space that if that part of their brain is engaged, it does help to diffuse that stress. So we will see some of that. That leaning or turning away, um, meaning if my dog is leaning into the people they're visiting, great. But if they're leaning away, 
even leaning into me, it could mean that they are a little stressed and a little nervous um, about the situation. Um, so we want to be aware of those kinds of things. Um, hypervigilance and pacing. I do have a little bit of a video to show you with the hypervigilance. Um, we often mistake it for them just taking in their surroundings. So it's really a matter of knowing your dog and knowing how much taking in of their surroundings they normally do versus is this normal or abnormal, a lot, not a lot, things like that. Just being very over aware of what is around them and making that very obvious. Okay. So yawning, we all know what a yawn looks like. And I just think these are cute pictures to share. So um, be aware of that. Um, in other parts of the dog world that I'm involved in, I hear people say a lot, oh, why are you tired? Why are you yawning? Um, and I, that little part of my brain always kind of kicks in and says, well, because they're stressed. Um, I, I don't say that typically, but um, knowing that that yawn is really more a stress response than it is a untired response. It's actually pretty true in humans too. We don't necessarily yawn because we're tired. We do sometimes, but not always. Okay, so this is, um, I don't remember which one this is. <laughs> this is one of our board members' chins, and she's going to show you what a little hypervigilance looks like and what tongue flicking looks like. So it is a short video. I will play it more than once if I can get it back. So just take a quick look here. Isn't she the cutest? But she's a little worried about her environment. So let me try playing that again for you so you can watch one more time. Watch her, if you watch for movement the last time, watch for the tongue flicks. If you watch for the tongue flicks, watch for movement this time. Outstanding, that cute little schmussy face. Love it, love it, love it. Okay, here's another tongue flick for you. Um, sometimes it can be super obvious like this one is. You can't really miss that beautiful pink tongue on that black and white dog. Um, but um, some dogs are a little bit more subtle about it. So something to watch out for. The scratching I mentioned, um, Again, just being aware of what it's really about. Um, you know, is this a brand new collar? Could it be itchy? Is it a brand new harness? Um, in, in the wintertime, some dogs get dry skin. Kind of be aware of what's going on so that you can better assess what that scratching is really all about. Okay, so this is my dog that I mentioned earlier that, that shivers. Um, we are not on a therapy dog visit. Obviously that leash is way too long, um, but we were at a new place um, about to do some scent work actually, um, an activity she really, really loves. But um, I, I like how obvious it was that she was really uncomfortable with what was happening outside the building. Um, I just opened the car. I'd opened her crate. Um, you'll hear all the traffic noise. You do have to watch her a little bit closely, but she is clearly not happy with this new environment. I don't see this a ton um, on therapy dog visits at all, but I definitely make sure that when I visit a new facility, we go early enough so that she can take that environment in and understand what it is that we're there for so that she's not doing this when we actually go to the visit. So take a quick look here. Little hypervigilance too. and a little tongue flick. So she's she's all kinds of stressed. <laughs> um, I will say that as soon as I got her out, she got to walk around a little bit, realize what we were doing, she was fine. But in that initial moment, she was like, oh my gosh, what are we doing here? Um, it's also a place that I think, it's an, um, um, a dog rehab center. So I think it smells very vet-like. Um, and so she does get a little nervous going to the vet. Um, so um, I think that that was part of it there. Oh, okay, here is some example of whale eye. Um, the where you just see where the dog's not very willing to move and move their head to look at you, but it's going to move their eyes to look at you. Um, 
if you're seeing this in your dog, take pictures, take some video, send it to someone. Um, from a dog training standpoint, I really don't like when I see this. Um, it's it's something that, that can, can escalate very quickly. It can also just be your dog and that's okay. And I'm okay with that too. Um, but I don't like when a dog is so nervous or afraid or stressed or whatever word you want to put in there negatively that they're not even willing to move their head. So um, obviously there are some health conditions that would preclude them moving and they would have to do things like this. Um, but um, just be aware, this is not something that I ever would want to see in a team I was evaluating or a team I was visiting with. Okay, exposed bellies, know your dog and know the difference. So this position is often misunderstood as a request for a belly rub. Um, if you've got a relaxed, loose, wiggly dog, you're probably right. It probably is just that, a request for a belly rub. It is most likely that request for attention. Ooh, you're here, you've got hands, Let, why don't you rub my belly? But, and in this picture, and I picked this picture for a reason, this dog is not relaxed. This dog is not at all wanting his belly rubbed, her belly rubbed, excuse me, uh, <laughs> very tense. Kind of a straight body, not that wiggly curved body. A little bit of side eye, whale eye. It's a little hard to tell in this picture, but I would definitely put that into that realm of the eyes don't make me feel all warm and fuzzy. Um, definitely a worried, stressful, fearful type of situation here. You can get in this, and this is where you need to know your own dog. You can get that combination. I'm gonna be really relaxed and roll over on my belly, but then we see that little tail tuck like on this picture, or we have a really loose wiggly tail, but we have a really tense body. That combination body language typically means the dog is uncomfortable, but willing um, and or worried, but working through it. So um, another example I'll give you, um, my, my guy that's not a therapy dog, <laughs> which might be why I talk about him so much in this, um, or the other way around. Um, when he was a puppy, we had some family members who would walk up to him and go, oh, hi, how are you, buddy? So he taught himself to flip over and expose his belly to diffuse the situation. Um, it's worked great for him for seven and a half years. Um, it is now what we call a learned behavior. Um, and he will do it on cue for us. Is it still based in stress or fear? Hmm, very long time ago, very deep rooted, yes. Um, but he's doing it more now because he knows he can do it and he will get a belly rub. So it evolved from a, 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 an avoidance behavior to a, I like having my belly rubbed behavior. Um, so that can also happen. Um, so again, know your dog, know what they're asking, know what they're talking to you about. Okay. Okay, that was a partial list of subtle signs. So let's talk, we, I mean, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the not so subtle signs of stress in our therapy dogs, and it does happen. It absolutely does happen. Um, it does not make them unsuitable for therapy dog work. It does not make them bad dogs. It means that in that particular situation, on that particular day, maybe with that particular person or in that particular facility, things did not go very well. Um, you know, it's not gonna be, uh, you know, if it's a one-time situation um, and you address it and work through it, it's not a reason to not be visiting with your therapy dog. It is something to be very aware of though, so that you can be making good decisions about what you need to do training wise or exposure wise or um, any of those things. So vocalizing, um, a lot of whining is one thing. Um, barking would be another, of course, growling, would be the third. Um, all of those are signs that your dog is uncomfortable in general. Now, whether they're barking because another dog startled them or a person startled them is very different than just walking through the hallways of a facility barking. Um, so it's definitely situational and we want to look at that big picture. Um, urinating, I, and I know that that's, everybody's kind of going, oh, my dog would never do that. 
but they do sometimes, right? Um, including happy or what we call submissive urination. It's actually neither happy nor submissive. It's stressful. I, uh, my, my anxiety is high. My fear is high. My stress is high. Whatever is going on, um, is high. And then that means that other parts of their body are not working as effectively. It also means other parts of their brain are not working as effectively. And so we might get some pottying. Um, obviously in young dogs, we see this a little bit more, um, just because they, they are young with immature bladders and immature bladder control. Um, but we definitely want to take that into account if that happens. Um, years and years ago, this was way, oh gosh, I don't even, I couldn't even tell you what year it was. So one of my very very first years as a therapy dog handler. So it was a really long time ago. Um, and we, I was visiting with another handler and her dog and we were walking through the hallways of a school going to do some reading with the kids and the bell rang. And he happened to be right underneath it. He also happened to be on the stairs and he let loose. Um, thank goodness for a handler who could think quickly on her feet who had her cleanup supplies with her, yay, um, and a janitor who loved dogs. So it ended up being okay. He was able to go back and do other visits, both he was able to do it himself, stress-wise, and the school still welcomed us back, understanding what had happened. Um, but it does happen, even to the best therapy dogs. Um, excessive licking. We talked a lot about licking both in last week's. We talked about it a little bit um, in this week since. Um, excessive licking, especially if your dog is typically not a licker, both uh, either of their own body or of others, definitely a stress sign that I would be paying attention to. Hiding, of course, avoiding, cowering, tail tucked, tail carriage, remember that breed comment I made earlier, and flattened ears. If I can't see a tail and I can't see ears, I'm gonna be looking more at the rest of the dog to see what's going on. Um, all things that are really um, pretty telling in most dogs. I know some dogs don't have tails. I know some dogs don't have much ear. Um, but I'm gonna, if I don't see much of a tail, I'm still gonna be watching. If I don't see much of an ear, I'm still gonna be watching. Make sure that those, we have nice, happy, flappy, pointed up, however their ears are supposed to be. Um, and that tail is carried naturally at the very least, relaxed and naturally or happy. Okay. Okay, so of course, what we want to see, because you know we're all positive here and we wanna talk about the things that we do wanna see. We want to see that relaxed face and body, um, you know, that, that I'm not so worried about mouth open or closed. I think that has a lot to do with individual dogs as well as individual breeds, but just relax. How does my dog look when they're super happy and sleeping on the couch or um, waiting for their meal or playing with their best buddy? I'm going to be looking for those kinds of things. No tension in the movement. Um, so that can range anywhere from the shivering to the hypervigilance to just a really um, um, not so great walk gait. Um, I wanna see that nice fluid dog-like gait. Now I know dogs get older and they, they don't walk as fluidly as they once did. That's okay, I'm not looking at that. I'm looking at that tense, maybe big dog kind of thing where they're real big and, and looking like they're tense. I wanted that nice bouncy gait, happy to be there, bouncing in. I know not all dogs bounce, but they all have that happy walk that when people look at them, they're like, oh, that's a happy dog. I like that. Wiggly behind, again, whether they have a tail or not, I want that whole body to be nice and wiggly and fluid and moving and, and just happy to be there. Smooth, wide tail wags. Um, I don't... Um, in most dogs, you're going to see just that kind of back and forth. And I'm so happy to be here. Look at my tail move. Maybe getting a little bit of vibration when they see their favorite person. Or if they're really, really happy, we get the helicopter wag, which is always my favorite. Um, but we, want, we don't want to see that short, little, frenetic, um, nervous-looking tail wag. We want something that makes us think positive, happy thoughts curved body, leaning into the people that you're visiting. If you're next to somebody, if they want to lean into you, great. But if you're across 
from the other person, we want we would be happier that they were leaning into them rather than into us. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily a body language thing, moreover as a handling kind of thing, but we definitely want them to be happy to interact. Okay, so a dog smiling may actually be a sign of stress. I've had dogs that did that, that cute little, um, my golden retrievers did it. So maybe people with golden retrievers um, are, are thinking, well, my dog smiles all the time. I know there are other breeds who do it too, but it could actually be a sign of stress. Sort of like, um, which one was I thinking of? Um, it'll come back to me. I apologize. Um, Oh, the belly rubs. I'm sorry. Um, it typically indicates appeasement. It's yes, they look happy. They look like they're smiling. But what it generally means is I'm no threat to you. So while it's not a bad thing to see, it also should tell you that your dog is not feeling 100% comfortable and that's why you're seeing it. Now, there are some dogs, I know that people are going to argue this with me, so I'm going to just say it up front. There are some dogs who smile because they are happy. They're happy, they're comfortable. Um, there is nothing wrong in their world. I totally get that. Be very aware of why your dog is doing it um, so that you can be your best advocate, be your dog's best advocate, excuse me. Okay, as I said at the bottom here, the key is to know your dog. Okay, so this is, um, this is actually my very first therapy dog who passed away a few years ago. Um, and she has that little smile. Um, so in her, she was happy and relaxed in this picture. In her, it actually occurred because she had um, some breathing issues. So would I say that this was because she was happy? Sometimes. Moreover, or more often, excuse me, it was that she was, um, she was having trouble breathing at that particular moment in time. So that's why I share the picture. Um, not for any other reason other than there's, there can be many different reasons for a body language piece. And we always want to try to be aware of what those might be. She, like I said, she, she was a beagle. She smiled when she was happy, but she also smiled when she was having trouble breathing sometimes um, in very hot, dry or very hot humid environments, she would struggle. So some of the assisted livings and things like that, we would see a lot more smiling. Okay, so bouncy dog, here we go. That's what we want. We want that bouncy, happy dog. I, I wanted longer video, sorry guys. I'm a terrible camera person, I need it done. <laughs> um, so some happy dogs. This is what we wanna see, those happy open mouth, nice, normal looking ears. I don't know about the tail. I can't see it. Um, but for all intents and purposes, this dog is happy and ready to rock and roll. Same thing, happy, relaxed, head tilted a little bit, tongue is a little bit spatula. Um, but I also know since this is my dog, I also know it was beastly hot that day. Um, so um, I'm going to always take things like that into account. Again, just more happy, happy dogs. Tried to get some different breeds here. Not so much dogs on therapy dog visits so that I didn't have to worry about photo releases. See, I thought ahead. <laughs> more happy dogs. Again, a little bit of a spatula tongue, but I also know in this picture, it was right after running. Um, they'd been out running around and playing. So keep in mind how, what your dog's activity has been, what the environment is like, and how that plays a part in it and super happy little doodly with a pink tail, ready to go here. Again, just some more happy, happy dogs, happy, relaxed ears, happy, relaxed body, happy, relaxed face, tongue. We're, we're looking at that whole picture all the time. That's my anxious boy. I had to put a picture of my anxious guy in there. <laughs> who would love to be a therapy dog to about three of you. <laughs> That's about his limit. And then Dolly, who was in the, the email, um, who is super chill, except in that new environment. So I always have to be aware of that and be taking that into account when we're going into those new situations so that she can be nice and acclimated and ready to visit without worrying about her environment. Um, it started off as a noise sensitivity many, many, many years ago that we worked through and sometimes just shows up in those situations like you saw. There was a lot of traffic noise and I think that that's probably pretty much what was getting her. 
Okay. The end. My very first set of therapy dogs many, many years ago. Okay. I'm gonna stop the share. Okay, Kelsey, what questions do we have that we can answer today? You have answered all of them in your presentation or I, I responded in the chat, but what I wanna reiterate that comes up in the chat is for most of, of your questions, the answer is you have to look at the dog as a whole. So it, that seems to be the theme that some dogs do one or two pieces, but your reminder that we need to look at our dog as a whole um, and those of you who know your dogs, that's great. Those of you who are tester observers, talk to that prospective team and ask them, oh, when you walk in the neighborhood, does your dog normally look behind her all the time? Does she normally get an idea of whether the behavior you're seeing that clues you in on stress signals is just the way that dog might be or if those are true stress signals? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, let me show you real quick a couple of, of references that are available to you right now. Um, if, if you will have more questions other than contacting us, um, let me share my screen again here and show you a couple of them that you can get online. Um, bear with me while I hit all the right buttons here. rid of that. So this is one of them. Um, it's available on um, Sophia Yin's website, drsophiayin.com. Um, the body language of fear in dogs. Um, like I said, some, I, I don't love her wording on this because sometimes it happens just because they're, they're anxious, they're stressed. Um, but these things do happen. So that's a great little infographics, um, short and sweet, easy, um, nothing too, um, there we go. And then she has a, um, the same artist has on her website, um, just doggy language um, with her Boston Terrier. Um, it's on doggydrawings.net. Um, all things that you can you can grab for yourself publicly um, and share with people as long as you don't alter it in any way. Um, just some different things on there um, to give you some ideas or, or maybe some information to talk to as TOs to teams or if you're a handler and you're trying to figure it out for sure. Um, she also, let me stop the share here. There we go. Um, and I'm not affiliated with, with Lily Chin or Sophia Yen or anything. You're just people that I use their resources because they offer them to us. Um, I just got, this is a great little book I keep in my Tustra Observer bag. Um, it's called Doggy Language, A Dog Lover's Guide to Understanding Your Best Friend. It's a, a Lily Chin book. Um, I keep it in my bag. So when I um, am testing, observing, or on a visit, if there's a question, um, I can, most of them, I don't think there's a, been anything in here I haven't found and said, hey, so here, look at this. Um, there's lots of them out there. I know there's another one that I don't have here um, and it's um, specifically on tails. Um, and that's another one that I, I keep. Um, I don't always have it in my bag. That's why it's not home. Um, it's at work right now, but uh, it's another great resource to share. There's lots of them out there. You, you can get on Amazon, I'm sure, or and, and then you can benefit ATD at the same time um, with Amazon Smiles. Um, and, and I know that there's lots of doggy body language books out there. Um, all of them are great and they're great resources resources for you. Lori, can you talk a little bit or just, just for a, a moment or two about these stress signals, but the dog's recovering? So like you showed your dog in the back of the car that she just needs a moment and then she can recover and go on through her visit. So just talk about what might um, be a visit or stress signals that would lead you to leave the visit or end the visit versus one that your dog can maybe recover from. And I know that's that's a big question, but if that's something that you might be able to address. Absolutely. So and we've gotten and we've gotten two requests to show the book one more time. <laughs> okay, I'll show the book. So maybe really that quick. while you talk. Okay, there we go. It's called Doggy Language. It's just a little tiny book. See, I can put my whole hand around it. <laughs> Doggy Language. And the author is Kelsey. Maybe you can put this in the chat box. Lily L I L I Chin C H I N. And I got mine on Amazon, so. 
Hopefully that helps. Doggy language right, by Lucian. Okay, awesome. Okay, so um, recovery and visit versus non-recovery and not visiting. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk specifically first about um, Dolly and her uh, shivering. So if I um, arrive at a facility and I get the dog that you saw in that video when I first open up the car and let her out, um, and I always make sure I'm early enough that I can assess before I go in. Um, we're gonna go take a little walk around. I need to walk her anyway, make sure she doesn't have to go potty, things like that. If within a few minutes, she is tail back up, she is showing me her happy signs, loose wiggly body for her, um, again, tail up. You, typically when she's shivering, her tail is down. Um, and that shivering has gone away, then I'm gonna go ahead and do my visit. Um, have I ever had a visit that I've left because she couldn't recover? Yes, I have. Um, we had a visit, um, it's probably been six or seven years ago now that they did a, a big outside, um, sort of outside um, wellness fair at our local university for the employees. Well, outside to them though, was in the football stadium in the big um, like concession area. So it was very loud and very echoey. And she could, she could, she walked right up to that. I, she didn't even shake when we got out of the car because we actually walk on campus a lot. So it was very familiar to her, but being in that environment with the echo sounds and people, Hey, how are you? Yelling and, and lots of activity that resulted in lots of echoey noises. We did call it a day a little early that day because she spent most of her time sitting very tight and shivering, except when people were petting her. So it was a tough decision from my perspective because she would go out and visit with people. But as soon as they left, she came right back in and got very tight and close to me and shivery. Um, and I just had to make a judgment call at that point. I knew she was uncomfortable in between and I wasn't willing to put anyone at risk at that point in time and opted to go home a little early. So her recovery time was very slow or basically non-existent um, and I didn't do it. So I'm looking again, know your dog, but how long does it typically take your dog to recover from being startled or being nervous under normal circumstances? Um, we always want to look at that resilience and if they have good resilience, I don't think there's anything wrong with going in and doing a visit if your dog is like, oh, okay, I got this now. But if your dog can't do that in some way, I'd let him know it's not a good day to do a visit. Um, and, and really looking at that whole picture. Now, stress can also have to do with health. Maybe your dog's not feeling great. Um, maybe on the way over, you hit the brakes a little too hard and they slid off the seat and that startled them. Um, little things like that can play a big part. Um, so just kind of look at that big picture. If, if you feel really comfortable with it, go for it. If you feel like your dog is really comfortable with it, go for it. If there's a question in your mind, I would rethink at the very least. Does that kind of give, is that some good information, that, Kelsey? That is. is. And yes, and I think a good follow-up question to that that was asked is, what can we do as handlers to help the dogs uh, try to get over, try to recover from something stressful. It sounds like the visit you had, there was no, that was just a bad scenario for the dog. And, and we all need to pay attention to that. But what might we do to help the dogs come back down and be able to focus on the visit? So with my dogs, um, and, and, you know, I can't answer for anyone else, unfortunately, I can just give you some ideas. With my dogs, it's about, can you engage with me? before we go into that visit? Can you um, just respond to simple things? Can you respond to your name? Can you um, let me, um, you know, switch off your harness to your therapy dog color? Um, those normal things, are they still happening normally? 
um, is what I'm what I'm shooting for. So I might to help my dog recover. I might take that walk around. Oh look, she's calming down. Uh, maybe she goes potty. We do that. Then I'm going to start getting ready for my visit. Oh look, she's still calm. Um, all the while I'm going to be talking to my dog. I'm going to be asking my dog certain things. You know, maybe you have you ask your dog to, for example, maybe you ask your dog to sit before you open a door. If your dog can't do it then maybe it's time to back it up and help them um, with that recovery. And how I would help with that recovery is, is through touch. I think tactile is super important for our therapy dogs. Um, and you can tell a lot by petting your dog. I, I know I can. Um, I can tell if there's still that little tiny bit of shiver still happening in there. Um, I can tell if that brow is still a little bit tense I guess the top of my head isn't really my brow. I can tell if this is a little bit tense by touching it. I might not be able to see it, but then if I'm running my hand over it or I'm rubbing that ear a little bit, any of those really um, sensitive touch points on our dogs and you know your dogs, um, those are all gonna be really helpful in that recovery. If you doing that with your dog isn't helping, it's time to go home in my opinion. Um, if, if your dog can't respond to your touch, how are they going to respond to the touch of the people you're visiting? Um, so I think touch is probably my biggest one. And then response to me um, and interaction with me is probably my second biggest one. Thank you. That's really great. Um, we've got some, some handlers here who are sharing their own dog's uh, stress signals or their signals that they're done with the visit. So um, we don't have any other questions. So I think, I think that uh, we can let everybody go enjoy the rest of their Sunday. Sounds like a great idea. We are super happy that you guys all want to come and join us for these. Um, thank you so, so much for coming and joining us. Um, next week, hopefully we'll see you all again. It will be a lot more demo oriented. I believe we're going to be doing tricks and tips for different visits and things. So um, my dogs will be happy to show off a little bit and maybe I'll get some video of some other dogs. Um, again, if you have any questions, make sure you let us know um, either via email, um, through the Facebook page, whatever makes the most sense. Um, yep, this was recorded. Um, the last week's is all set to go, I think almost, right? Um, and it will be posted on the website um, so you can watch it again. Um, we did write up a little summary too. Um, we're just really happy you guys are all here and wanting to learn. Um, it's great to see everybody's faces. I love it. <laughs> That's the one thing I hate about masks is I don't get to see people's faces nearly as much as my brain needs. So um, I think that's it. We can stop recording.